This is the Mobile Tech Podcast, brought to you by worldpodcasts.com. Now here's your host, Tank Girl, Miriam Joar. Brought to you by MediaTek. Hi, and welcome to the Mobile Tech Podcast. I'm your host, Miriam Joar, and today is Thursday, April 8th, 2021. And my guest is the awesome Finbar Monian of MediaTek. Hi, Finbar. How are you? Hi, Mariam. I'm doing well. Good to see you. Good to talk to you again. Yes, thanks for being on the show. We're also going to have a Rich Woods later on the show as well. So stay tuned for that, where we're going to cover the news and reviews for this week. But Finbar, I wanted to have you on because I've noticed something really interesting that's been happening with this pandemic in the last year and something that I think MediaTek is really well positioned to be an expert at, and that's smart TVs, right? We all use our mobile phones at home right now on Wi-Fi and stuff, but ultimately TVs have become a real huge part of our lives, not just for entertainment, but for, you know, productivity. So you folks have a lot of influence in this field with your chipsets. Yeah, no, it's good. Good observation, Mariam. And it, I think it's true. I mean, we've certainly over the last year with COVID and everybody sort of sheltering at home and spending more time at home, we've seen a, a surge in TV demand. I mean, the, the US TV market's been up 15, 20 percent year over year, you know, even on a global basis. I think in the last quarter of 2020, we saw record shipments of TVs. And, you know, we see it as exactly what you're describing, you know, this trend towards, first of all, I would guess a lot more use of the TV and home entertainment, but also the emergence of a lot of new use cases and new ways that people are using TV, um, maybe compared to the past. So it's certainly an exciting area for um, for us and, and for the industry, I would say. Yeah. And so I'm kind of curious, how did MediaTek address this in 2020? Obviously, 2021 has just started. But in this past year, obviously, you're seeing this trend and you're seeing some other trends. And I'd be curious to know what these trends are. But I also feel like, are you seeing an increase, obviously, in chip requests from manufacturers? And are you seeing a shift in this manufacturing landscape? Because I kind of feel like some of the phone brands we all know are starting to bleed into smart TVs and stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, we're seeing I think we're seeing all of that. Right. I think a few things have happened. And I think, you know, from our perspective, you know, as the number one TV chipset vendor out there, you know, I think some of these trends were happening, um, but probably COVID and and the last year maybe have accelerated some of them. Um, You know, for one, I think we're seeing consumers gravitating towards what we would see as smarter, bigger, better TVs. Right. So more more smart TVs more more focus on you know higher end 4k and even 8k tvs coming and a lot of focus on you know better better picture quality better use cases etc and we can we can we can talk more about that i think the the second trend we see is obviously the there's sort of this technology diffusion between the smart tvs and smartphones right with the same operating systems application ecosystems multimedia capabilities you know and it's yeah some technologies like picture quality and display technologies have migrated from the tv world into mobile over the years newer technologies maybe like some of the ai technologies that landed first in smartphones are now sort of migrating over to the tv platforms and i think that's probably what's fueling, you know, the rise of new TV OEMs and TV brands coming from the mobile space because they bring a lot of that capability, that know-how, that technology, and they can migrate that to, you know, deliver new experiences for their customers beyond mobile into the TV and the home space. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I'm kind of curious. So you talked about some of the trends. I guess one of them is smart home control. That's a big part, especially in this pandemic time where people are at home, right? Yep, absolutely. And so are you seeing people use, you know, obviously there's the ecosystems of Amazon and Google Mm -hmm. with their assistants and and of course, you know, Apple, but I don't think there's any TVs that have Siri on them yet. I might be wrong. I mean, other than the Apple TV box itself. But are you seeing, especially in China and stuff like that, are you seeing some companies actually implement their own assistants running on your chipsets? Um, yeah, we're we're definitely seeing a trend towards um, more integration of the voice control and voice assistance into the sets, into the TVs, and that can have a whole host of of use cases. I mean, just from the simplicity of 
um, you know, voice control of the TV and the channel and the setting and what you're watching. I mean, I think we've already seen that emerge in, in remote controls and some of the OTT and set-top boxes that we see in the US. So that's definitely a trend. Yeah. Do you think actually, as an aside, that remote controls are going to evolve even further? I mean, obviously, people still like to have a traditional remote, but we're starting to see much more voice control or microphones mounted on TV remotes that let you control your TV or even better, people just using their smartphones to control their TVs. And I presume that the technology lets you accommodate all this now. So, you know, do you see a trend in that area? Are people ditching their remotes, I guess? I wouldn't say so much as ditching as probably augmenting the remotes with voice capability and the TVs with voice capability. And I, I think it ties into this other trend of like smarter, um, you know, because what we're seeing obviously in the US and in other regions as well is the proliferation of streaming services, right? So I think, you of know, course, the last yeah. year has seen, you know, a whole host of launches of new streaming services from Apple, from Peacock, from Disney, from Discovery, etc. So I think it's becoming more and more confusing for consumers to find the content they want to watch, right? So having easy ways to search and find the content that they want to watch and voice is, I think, a fairly natural way to do that, right? So I think that's an inevitable trend. Um, you know, it does present some challenges, of course, to have the voice and the, um, you know, the voice detection built into things like the TV, where you've also got the TV projecting its own audio, right? So that presents a certain amount of challenges for the acoustic guys. But again, the technology is moving in ways that can can support that now. So that's definitely a trend we see. Yeah, I mean, I presume that any of the technologies and advances that MediaTek has developed for smart speakers, since you're also a leader in that field, immediately apply to the chipsets for smart TVs if you use voice control, right? So Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, there, there are some different challenges, but the core of it is leveraging off the same core technology, yes. Fantastic. So let's talk actually about a typical TV chipset. You know, they're very similar to the SOCs used in phones. I want to kind of relate this to my audience a little bit. But there are some very critical aspects that are much more prioritized, like the codex for video decoding and things like upscaling and HDR and all these, anything that affects how the image gets displayed on the panel, right, is probably a lot different than what you have on a, on a phone. Or am I wrong? No, I think it's, it's, you know, at the very simplest way, it's maybe how I think about it as well. I mean, in, you know, the, the, you know, the sort of the application processor piece of a smart TV or a smartphone, and it's almost harder to distinguish between those now, right? I mean, you know, you've got CPUs, GPUs, you may, you may scale them differently for a smartphone or a TV, but they start to look architecturally very similar. On the phone, you have a lot of other capability to do with the cellular connectivity and the modem. Right. On the TV, you have a lot of capability to do with the TV broadcast stack and exactly what you were describing, you know, the picture quality, picture enhancement, display resolution, video codecs, because at the end of the day, you know, a 55, 65 or larger inch TV display that you're watching in your living room is going to be a lot less forgiving when it comes to visual effects than maybe a, you know, a six inch or a five inch um, smartphone, for example. Um, so I think there's, you know, but that's where some of the technology gets developed. And then of course, migrates into some other platforms like mobile to do picture quality enhancement as well. And that's, I think, always been a, a big area of focus for the TV development, the TV SOCs is really picture quality, picture quality enhancement, uh, etc. Yeah. So 70% of all TVs are powered by MediaTek, which is kind of incredible to me. And it's about 2 billion powered TVs. And this is not going to end. This is not going to stop. This is a major growth sector for the company. So, you know, how much of that overall business is, you know, how does it compare to, say, your SOC business in mobile? Um, I mean, the TV business is a very sizable business for us. And as you mentioned, we have, you know, we're, we're happy to power, you know, a large number of TVs every year from many, many different brands, um, all the different smart uh, TV operating systems. And there are lots of them out there from Android TV, Amazon's Fire TV, Roku, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, it's a sizable business for us. I think the exciting thing is, as I mentioned earlier, that the the consumers are gravitating towards, you know, smarter, bigger, better, right? Which obviously demands more capable chipsets, more capable um, SOCs. And then I think the other trend that we see uh, in this industry is, of course, 
um, the need for better connectivity. So that drives higher end Wi-Fi yeah. connectivity on those smart TVs and new Wi-Fi standards as people, you know, for exactly what you were describing earlier about things like smart home controllers, you know, you want the TV to be part of that mesh network in your home going forward, give the best experience. Yeah. And in fact, Samsung just launched an 8K OLED TV with Wi-Fi 6E with a MediaTek chipset, right? Exactly. So that's uh, continuing the partnership we had uh, with Samsung, where they um, adopt MediaTek Wi-Fi for their high-end uh, 8K TV. So this is the new launch for 2021, bringing the new Wi-Fi 6E capability into the into the TV. So that's very exciting news as well. And you know, the other thing that I think is an interesting parallel between mobile and smart TVs is that, you know, 8K TV is obviously becoming a thing, but 4K is still like the bread and butter. But 4K is now supporting up to 120 hertz refresh rates. Does that sound familiar to anyone listening? <laughs> exactly. You know, the phones are all 90 to 120 hertz refresh now, except for Apple. But I think they're going to be coming on board soon. And TVs obviously, are, you know, in some case have been there for a while, but I think this is coming down to the to the lower tiers now, right? Yeah, no, I think we're seeing, like if you look at the TV business holistically for the next couple of years, you know, 8K, you know, 4K 120, you know, even 4K with MEMC, so motion estimation, motion compensation for, you know, picture enhancement. Those are the growing segments. And while, you know, more basic 4K and 2K TVs still sell, they're on a kind of a gradual decline over, over the next couple of years. And it is the kind of same, you know, trends that we're seeing, you know, I think one of the factors that's driving this, of course, is is gaming, right? So we've just right. seen, we've just seen 2020 with the launch of, you know, major new gaming platforms, you know, obviously, hardcore gamers out there understand, you know, the benefit of refresh rate, um, latency, responsiveness. Um, and I think that becomes more and more visible in mobile. And that's one of the factors that's driving the trend you were talking about in terms of faster refresh displays on, on mobile. But of course, obviously on TVs as well, that becomes more and more critical. As an aside, do you see a future where the connectivity is wireless is so good and fast and low latency that gamers will cast video directly from their gaming phones to their smart TVs? I think I think that's inevitable, right? I mean, obviously there are connectivity technologies like Wi-Fi is not stopping, you know, Wi-Fi 6, 6E, Wi-Fi 7 is going to be coming, Yeah, you know, faster data rates, enhancements in, on latency, um, you know, not to mention, of course, a lot of the stuff that's happening on 5G latency improvements. Um, so, but I think the connect, the wireless connectivity technologies are certainly putting a big focus on addressing issues like latency. You know, gaming is one use case for that, but there are others, of course, that are driving of course, those yeah, trends. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Video conferencing being one of them, obviously. Yeah. So that actually segues us into something I wanted to ask you about. We talked about how the SOCs on the phones and the SOCs on the TVs are getting more and more similar. And one of the things you see on a phone chip is support for ISP, which is image signal processing, which is camera support. And we're seeing more and more TVs with built-in cameras for, you know, things like Zoom calls and built-in Zoom clients. And how much of a trend is that? How much do you see that happening right now on your end, you know, supplying these chips to manufacturers? Um, it's certainly something that people are working on and looking at. Um, and again, I think it's, for us, I think it's one of those trends that was probably coming along anyway, but just got a kick and got accelerated by by COVID. And it's exactly what right. you described, right? You know, you know, we all spend our life for the last year on on Zoom calls and 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 video calls for work, but also for social, right? And so, you know, most of us have been doing those on our our laptops and our our tablets. But you know, imagine you know the comfort of doing it with a glass of wine in front of the TV in your living room when you're talking to your family, rather than than on a, a tablet for example it can be a more a more immersive more comfortable experience perhaps right yeah and then i think the the idea of watch parties and people having the ability to share a viewing experience whether it's a sporting event or a movie you know and you, you see the the streaming clients are building in support for the ability to synchronize viewing of the same content from different locations you know it all feeds that same you know together apart kind of concept that people have talked about over the last year, right? And, you know, this the TV is still, for most of us, the central hub of our home, right? Um, Indeed, where we yeah. sit down to relax. So to remove yourself from the work environment, um, you know, where all of the, obviously the phones, tablets, PCs, all have this capability built in, um, I think it's an inevitable trend that the TVs will start to integrate more and more of that 
feature set and capability going forward. And one of the features that we are sorely missing on our own TV, which we actually purchased just before the pandemic or when the pandemic was starting, we haven't really had a TV in our home. We've had projectors and stuff, but we wanted something a little small for the bedroom. And, you know, Bluetooth is noticeably absent on our TV, although I'm sure the chipset probably has it. But the biggest thing I'm seeing is people wanting to listen with headphones at night, and maybe multiple people simultaneously on the same TV. And this is an area where I think that, you know, again, we've seen this on phones where phones are casting to multiple audio devices. And I suppose this is a feature that must exist on some MediaTek chipsets these days, because I think some of the new TVs now support Bluetooth, multiple Bluetooth devices at the same time. So yeah, and if you look at the, um, we mentioned earlier the you know Samsung adopting our Wi-Fi 6E connectivity solution, but that chipset also integrates support for Bluetooth 5.2, so that will have built-in support for some of the um, you know low-power multi-user audio interfaces that I think you're referring to. So again, I think that's another uh, cool use case that can be enabled with that connectivity technology. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it. Let's talk about AI, because when people think of AI, they think of the assistance and the voice control of their appliances and and lights from their TV. But there's way more going on here. We're seeing this also on phones right now, where AI is being used to do things like HDR and then also um, motion interpolation and upscaling of resolution. And in the same way as we've seen AI really help with uh, computational imaging on phones, like improving camera performance by recognizing the scene and interpreting it and enhancing the parts of the scene that are important, we're seeing the reverse at output with the chips doing this on your uh, on MediaTek's chipsets for the TVs, right? And this is yeah. a huge part. And the neural network and machine learning processors that you're putting in your mobile chipsets are obviously helping a lot here in your TV chipsets, right? Yeah, ab- absolutely, Mariam. The, um, you know, the, for sure, the AI technology is a big area of investment and focus for MediaTek. And we've talked a lot in the past, you and I and others, about how that's deployed in the phones. But we're now seeing that same technology um, develop or, or be integrated into our TV chipsets. It's, you know, same technology, same capability, deployed a little differently because of the different use cases. But I think in TVs, it really comes down to a few big areas. One is what we would call AI for picture quality enhancement. And really, this is allowing the TV SOCs to adaptively and dynamically adjust the settings. So everything from um, color saturation, brightness, sharpness, all the usual things that enhance the picture quality, either based on the scene, um, as in you're watching a sporting event or a movie or whatever, or even locally, right? So identifying faces and doing different settings just for the part of the image that is covering the face. So you get the kind of settings that are optimal for that. Whereas obviously in the past, with before this technology, these were kind of global settings that were preset. And then, yeah. you, know, you know, you got, and how many people, you know, they get the TV, they click one button, that's the setting, and they never change it, right? Whereas that's if it's, me. <laughs> yeah, me, all of us, right? Even even those of us in tech were too lazy to be getting up and changing that. But I think now that this can be enabled as part of an adaptive multi-frame optimization using AI technology, it's seamless to the user, and ultimately the user is getting a better a, a better experience. Yeah. And and you mentioned the second area, which is, I think, super resolution, which is exactly that, right? You know, there are brute force, not so elegant ways to upscale full HD content to 4K TVs. And as 4K TVs become more popular, you know, that becomes necessary. But with AI technology, we can apply, you know, multi-frame upscaling technology that will give, you know, again, higher quality images Um, better overall user experience. Um, And, and, you know, those are probably the two areas where we're using AI technology most today. Um, There will be others, I'm sure, as we go forward. Yeah, no, I think it's going to make a huge difference. We've seen what it's done for imaging and and, and phones, and I think that's definitely the area where we're going to see a huge improvement in quality without necessarily having the manufacturer having to spend more on their panels. I mean, obviously, you want a good panel to start with, but in the same way as you don't always put the best camera hardware to keep the prices down on a phone, you can get better results with computational photography. Same thing I think is going to happen with TVs and 
this is just math and this is just compute. And this is where, you know, being a company like MediaTek, having that expertise in, you know, making processors is really going to pay off, I think, for manufacturers. One last thing that's more about an overall view is our younger generations were born and raised on the internet and born and raised mobile and mobile first. And TVs are still a big part of their lives, but they're more of a peripheral product to them an accessory as it were. And we're seeing these young brands like OnePlus and Xiaomi coming into the TV space. And do you think that's going to change the way these TVs operate compared to the kind of the status quo? Are we already seeing a change in the user experience? Is it more phone-like? We talked about the ditching the remote thing earlier, but I kind of feel like young people have a different approach. Like when I was younger, TV was you turn it on and you'd surf through the up and down channels. That doesn't seem to be much the case anymore. Now you do pick your service and you pick your show based on the search capabilities or the voice search and that's it. So I think there's already been a transition, but do you see another one happening, especially as these new TV brands come in with that mobile background that they bring to the table? I I think that's a really good point. You know, I I grew up with the same experience as you did, so I can totally recognize the the new experience, recognize it maybe doesn't relate to me, but I can recognize it. But I think it is an interesting trend where I think these, you know, companies that are, you know, mobile first moving into the home and the TV space, I think that it opens up the possibility for them to bring more of this cross-platform experience, different user experiences, whether it's, you know, how they use mobile and connectivity um, to uh, control and, and, and influence the TV or the viewing experience or even what people do on the TV. And or even, you know, in cases like Xiaomi, for example, they also have invested heavily in an IoT and smart home ecosystem. Oh, so yeah, you, can yeah, see them, you could see them, you know, beginning to tie all of these things together to, to create new experiences. You know, and I think, you know, the, their their audience, I think one of their primary targets is clearly, you know, young mobile first consumers, right? So I think yeah. that's um that's inevitable. And I think we'll see a lot more developing in those areas as we go forward here. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think there's we're gonna see, you know, wearables that are designed to control your TV, your smart TV as well, like where you don't have to do voice, you can just lift your wrist and then you have a little widget on your watch or whatever that lets you control your TV. I think some of that stuff is, is starting to happen. I think it's going to be very interesting. So yeah, I mean, it's it's great to see how MediaTek is, you know, pushing in this area and leading the field. And I'm actually really excited to see a cross-pollination between the mobile and the smart TV side, because I think there's a lot of smart TV things that the mobile phones can benefit from. Things like time-of-flight cameras to recognize, the TV can recognize who's watching right now, right? So if it's like me watching, it knows that I always watch Netflix and this is the last show I was in. It selects my profile, stuff like that. And then if it's multiple people, it says, oh, well, it's the family watching. So I'm going to give them choices. Stuff like that I see coming and that's directly coming from mobile. Like, I mean, these these ISPs and, and time-of-flight sensors and things are something that you obviously have expertise in on the, on the mobile side that you can integrate. So I think you're very good position to make this integration between the two the two sides and that's exciting no it is that's that's exactly what we see as well and that's clearly where we're focused well on that note we should continue with the rest of the show and i want to thank you finbar for bringing your wisdom to the table on uh, you know smart tvs this it's an area of that i don't really cover on the podcast very much but i feel like especially of this entire year of the pandemic, I'm no longer pointing out to you and thinking, you know, whatever, you're just an appliance. Now I'm thinking of it more like you are a big screen mobile device in a way, you know, in my head. And so I think that, you know, everything is very much integrated these days. And so we're going to thrive on the podcast every now and then to cover things that are a little beyond mobile, but related to it. I'm glad we started with MediaTek and smart TVs on this. No, thanks, Mary. I'm happy to be a little diversion in your journey. It's, it's been a good discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Mary. So, Rich, that was interesting, right? Yes, it was super interesting. Rich Woods has joined us now for the rest of the show from NeoWin. And Rich, I want to talk about LG because LG is like, look, LG has called it quits in mobile. How do we feel about that? What do we do about that? How do we feel about that? Well, for, first of all, I mean, I mean, to me... Obviously, like there's so much, there's so much that they've done over just over the years, 
even just in their time with the Android space, but also before that, yeah. there's so much that they've done that's just innovative. They've made so many products that I've loved. Um, but at this point, I can't say that I'm I'm going to miss whatever they were going to do next. Well, I do a little bit because, I mean, I'm torn, right? I think they haven't really been relevant in mobile in a long time because the the marketing has always just been so flawed. I just feel like they're very innovative as a company. They brought us so many firsts, and we can talk about that in a minute. So, so let, let me let me ask you though, one product, one LG product, what, what, or one LG smartphone, which one? Of all of them, yeah. Oh, I think I'd go with the latest, like the LG Wing. It's just it represents everything that's kind of quirky about LG, and also everything that's innovative about LG. It really does. And do, do you know what I love about that thing is that they just, they sold it on all the carriers. It wasn't just like when they first announced it, it looked like it was going to be some concept phone that we were never going to be able to actually touch maybe outside of a trade show or something. I mean, it did. And that's my point. It, it became yeah. real. They sent units out to everybody. I know. Yeah. That's yeah. why I love LG or loved LG mobile is because they would throw quirkiness out the window and go like, yeah, take it. You know, mm -hmm. don't like it, it's too bad. And I got to give them props for that. But at the same time, I'll link to Marquez's video and Mr. Mobile, Michael Fisher's video in the show notes because both of them made some really good points. And I think, you know, I'm not parroting them because I, I'm mostly I'm saying I'm, I'm agreeing with them because there is a lot to be said here. But the thing is that Samsung has experimented. That's how they got us the Note. That's how they got us the Z Fold and the Z Flip. Right. That's how they got us the Galaxy Camera big flop back in the day. <laughs> but the thing about Samsung is that they always were able to experiment because they had a main line, right? Think of it as right. software engineering, right? It's like Chrome builds or Edge builds or Firefox builds. There is a stable branch which the consumers are using which is reliable and works and consistent and predictable and people know what to expect. And then there's the dailies. You know, you can download a build of Microsoft Edge or, or Chrome or freaking Firefox every day. That's pretty much a beta and use at your own risk. But it's fun and quirky and you get new features and some of them stick and some of them don't. Mm -hmm. And Samsung was able to do that. Have that stable branch with the S series. And then have, you know, the experimental stuff. Some of it became a mainstream. The note became a thing. The, I think the folding phones are well on their way to becoming a thing eventually when the price gets better. But they're not going to go away. The Galaxy camera was flawed and I loved it, but it was flawed and I could see the idea, but it didn't work and it went away. And I think that's where LG wasn't able to compete. They had to merge those two branches. They had to make their stable branch, essentially their daily beta branch. Um, and you can't do that. They did. Like th there was a lot of stuff in like the V series that was somewhat experimental. Even just, even just, even just remember the V10 had that second display, which I thought was awesome yeah. for its time. It was like, like a ticker for, you know, shortcuts or, or, or notifications or something, but that was their fall flagship. You know, there wasn't like you're saying, that's not really room for experimentation in, and just that flagship line there. I mean, we could have argued that for a while that when they had the G series and the V series, they could have done the G series as a rock solid thing. And then the V series of experimenting, right. but they didn't really. But then you had the G5. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, that's how, and I think the G5 was the beginning of the end in my book. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. I think that, okay. look, I'm not against the idea of modularity, but the way they did it, I knew immediately that those friends, unquote, whatever they call right. them, right, would never yeah. stick around. Immediately, there's a flaw there. And the flaw is that phones are getting bigger in size, and you could already tell back then that was happening. And yet, this thing was physically dependent on the size of the phone, right? Because the chin had to be removed for the stuff to be installed and replaced with another chin. Right. That's the, well, that's the problem with modular accessories. It's like we as as smartphone nerds love the idea of modular accessories and things oh, that you yeah. can just plug in and, you know, do do cool stuff with. But to consumers, it's not practical. And the same thing goes for the Moto Z series that they did for four generations. And I think they're finally done with. 
And I think that was a better approach and a better implementation. And also they decided to go early on with a large form factor, right? So True. that they knew that they could grow the screen size. And if you look at the evolution from the Z to the Z4, you know, the screens kept getting bigger and pushing the edges of the bezel yeah. smaller and smaller. And in the end, the Z4 was pretty much all screen and rightfully so. And I actually think it was great. It wasn't a great phone, but I think that what they did there in terms of industrial design, build, size, planning for the future and the modularity and the ease of it, applying it, not having to shut down the phone because you have to take the battery out like the G5 to change your accessories, all oh, that yeah. stuff, wow. right? I forgot about that part, yeah. <laughs> and this is what I mean. And then the other thing is the G5 came around at a time when Samsung had finally switched with the year before, I think with the Galaxy S6 to metal and glass to match Apple's like that really premium feeling like jewelry, feeling like a, a nice watch or a nice mm. piece of you know hardware build quality that everyone was expecting on the flagship end. And right. LG comes along with a painted metal chassis and a plastic chin end cap where the fit and finish yeah. was never perfect and it looked janky. And, and we're like, Yes, the G4 was plastic with a leather optional leather back, but it didn't make any excuses for itself. It was just plastic and it was nice, but it was, you know, kind of the, I thought the last breath. I thought like, you know, the G4 next year, the G5 needs to be metal and glass, aluminum mm. sandwich kind of thing. And they didn't do that. They went like with this weird quirky and then they, if I felt that like they lost a generation there. And a lot of people were put off by that. You know, there's a clear lineage between the Optimus G which wasn't very well known, to then, the, right. which is the G1, to the G2, then G3, and G4. They kept growing in size. They had the buttons in the back. They kept adding better features and more display and less bezel. And then the G5 comes along and it just doesn't right. even fit the industrial design. It's like just weird, quirky, completely weird thing. And you know, the G3 and the G4 were so good. Mm -hmm. uh, the G3, I think it was the first phone with the QHD display. Correct. It had the, it had the, the laser focused camera which I don't think anyone else was doing at the yeah. time. And that was good. Yeah. And then they did the G flex too. I think, I guess it was yeah. probably that fall. And I love that thing. I love like it the, too. Yeah. Yeah. I I'd like, like people talk about that curved screen, like, like it was some kind of gimmick or something, but when you pick it up and use it, it feels so natural uh -huh. to, to swipe across that curved screen. And then they use the same camera as the G3. They put the Snapdragon 810 in it. It was 1080p instead. I think the original G Flex was yeah. 720p. And Correct. I, man, I love that thing. Yeah. You know all your numbers. Yeah. Oh, I just love that thing. <laughs> Let's go through some some innovations. Obviously, you can go uh, you know, as far back as the LG Prada, which was announced, I think, around the same time as the iPhone, but shipped before the iPhone with a capacitive screen. It was a dumb phone though. Okay. So they did capacitive first. Then they did dual core first. Then they did quad HD first. As mm -hmm. you said, with the G3. Oh, they did small bezels first with the G2, putting the buttons in the back. Oh, okay. Right? And then the G3 kind of grew that to quad HD. Then on the G4, they did the first F of a 1.8 lens. Everybody oh, was in 2.2, yes. 2.4 land then. And all of a sudden, they come out with an F-stop that's like significantly better. And immediately, the low light results were significantly better. And more importantly, yeah. they put like five axis OIS on that. Like it had OIS on the G3 before, but the four, the G4 had the crazy five axis OIS where if you were still enough, like braced yourself without leaning against something, just bracing your hands against your chest, you could take a long exposure of half a second and the OIS could compensate. Wow. Yeah. I mean, yeah. remember, this is before the days of night mode with image stacking where you can move and it, it stacks the images and lines them up for you and you get a good low light shot. Back then mm -hmm. you had to do literally keep the shutter open for a duration of time and any right. motion would appear in the photo. So this was a big deal. And I know a lot of people are going to go, Miriam, the G4 sucked, boot loops, boot loops. Yeah, a lot of people had problems with their boot loops on, these, on that generation, G2 Flex, G4, G3. But you know what? I didn't. and I didn't either. And a lot of people I know didn't either. So I think that it sucks that they had these issues, but it doesn't make the G4 a bad phone. It brought some improvement in imaging that I think were really significant for their time. In the same way as Pixel brought some stuff um, you know, over, over the last few years. And so then you look at the G5, even though it sucked in terms of its industrial design and this idea of modularity that's half-baked, it mm -hmm. had the first ultra-wide camera. 
Like, isn't that a standard yeah. feature? You see that even on two hundred dollar phones. Now. Was that on the G five? That was yeah, the first G five. Wasn't the V twenty? Am I mistaken? No, the V twenty came after. I think. Okay. Okay. Because the V thirty came after the G six, and the V forty yes. after the G seven. No, you're right. Because it was G th- it was G three G flex two G four V ten G five. Okay. You V20. got it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Technically, the V ten had dual front facing cameras, which we yeah, saw. Yeah, that of the right. Pixel 3 XL later on, like having an ultra wide mm-hmm. in the front for wide angle portrait. I mean, again, this is another innovation that, you know, I glossed on them, but yeah. the G6, let's talk about G6, for example. I think they completely turned around the industrial design by making that thing super slick, high quality aluminum and glass sandwich, yeah. but they should have done that with the G5. And this is how they lost the plot, I think. But if you look at the G6, first 18 by nine screen, everyone was 16 mm-hmm. by nine then, remember? And then yeah. Samsung went one step further by going uh, like 20 by nine with the S8 or whatever it was. And then ever since then, we've been on this, you know, high aspect ratio, tall screen thing, which I think ergonomically makes a ton of sense. In fact, I would argue yeah. that LG did 21 by nine on the BL40, which was a capacitive touchscreen dumb phone, like feature phone, 2008 or 2009. Look it up, BL40. It's one of the most beautiful looking, like non-smartphone capacitive phones. And that thing has a 21 by 9 display on it, but it was a one-off, right? Like, they never did more with it. BL40. Wow. Look at it. Isn't uh, it I'm great? I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, I reviewed that, wild. And, and I loved it. Cool. It had a good camera to it at a Schneider Kreuznach 5 megapixel camera with autofocus. And, it, you know, we're talking 2008, 2009, or whenever that came out. Anyway, the point I'm making is that G6, and then G7 just, it seemed like it stopped there. Like, G7 was just like, trying to compete with the Jonesies. It was a good yeah. phone, but it didn't stand out. That was when they tried to they they tried to change focus. That's when they first started saying we're not going to do new phones every year. We're going to do it when there's real technological advancements to right. make. That's when they introduced the ThinQ brand, which became Think and then ThinQ again. And that was another thing that was a big misstep. Yeah. Like Yeah. Nobody could understand and relate to that brand because maybe in Korea it's a thing because they have an ecosystem there, but here, you know, there's a lot of devices that actually work with the ThinQ system, like their smart TVs and their smart washing machines and stuff. Mm-hmm. But I don't think the consumers in the US are aware enough to understand that that was a thing. And so just LG G7 would have made a lot more sense, you know? Yeah. 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 I don't know. It's a little <laughs> bummer. And this is what I mean. So, but the G5 was really, I think, like they were doing so well at, to that point. And adding the ultra wide on the G5 was a stroke of genius. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, let's not remiss the V40 was the first phone after the G7 with three lenses, with a telephoto, an ultra wide, and a main lens. Was it? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They were the, just for a very brief amount of time before Samsung jumped in, they were the first to do the three lenses. And you know that that's the way that we all knew it was going to go at some point, right? Because because LG had done ultra wide first. Then I think it was Apple that jumped in with the the telephoto with uh, was it seven plus, and then you had to decide if you're getting a dual lens camera. Do I want regular and ultra wide, or do I want regular and telephoto? And you're like, you know what? Next year it's just someone's going to do all three. And yeah, V40 was the first one, and. Mm-hmm. That V40 was such a great phone. And then, you know, like I felt that that G7 V40 was the first time that that LG wasn't experimenting too much. They were just really trying to hold their space in the smartphone world. And Mm -hmm. unfortunately, they were already declining in terms of sale and, you know, kind of mind share of flagships. They've always been strong in the mid-range and affordable phones in the U.S. because of prepaid, right? That was another thing nobody ever talks about because we are always focused on the best phones. But like the LG Stylo, right? A phone with a stylus, it's essentially similar to the Moto G stylus. Basically a poor person's Galaxy Note. And and it sold in bucket loads. (laughs) Yeah, it sold so well in North America. Like... And yet it wasn't enough. And I think the reason it wasn't enough is because you need the mind share of, you need the Halo product. You need the mind share up there. And they yeah. missed the boat with one generation there on the G5 by trying to be innovative and different with the modularity. I don't want to knock them for trying it, but I think it was misguided to try that on their bread and butter phone. That should have been a V series feature, you know? Sure. Yeah. I, I just, it's, you know, we could, we could talk about all their, like they've done all this cool innovative stuff. We talked about the wing, which was awesome. But did you tell anybody, did you recommend to any friends to buy the wing? 
You know, um, was there any, any, when was the last time if someone said, Hey, what's the best phone to buy that you said it would be an <laughs> LG phone? Because one, I couldn't deal with, with their software. Anytime yeah. I was using an LG phone, it was, it was custom launcher, uh, third party keyboard. Yeah. Yep. That, that was the, the first thing from, from the beginning. No, I agree. There is also that. The software is even back in the days of Optimus G, the first, the G1. I went to Korea. I was at Engadget. They flew us out there and gave us the wine and dine red carpet because they're funny. Like, we want the big media of the world to understand that we're going head to head with Samsung on the Galaxy here, the Galaxy S series. And we were impressed, but the software already back then was like, ugh. Like, TouchWiz <laughs> was terrible, but this was even oh. worse. I think everybody's software back then was terrible. Yeah, but so. it didn't, they never really recovered. Your One UI, I think, yeah. is a step in the right direction. HTC at the end was starting to get it. You know, They were. But LG, like, the V60 is probably the epitome of that. The V60 felt, like, hardware-wise, you came out with a flagship. That was a year ago, right? They came out mm. with a flagship that lacked a telephoto when the previous right. generation of these phones, the V50 and the V40, had a telephoto that lacked 120 hertz or 90 hertz refresh rate when everyone else had been doing it for a year. And that had software that felt like it came out of the G4. Right. And and, and they also, they, they started doing this thing towards the end, but like removing that telephoto, it's they were trying to hit lower price points. They were trying to say, hey, if you buy a Samsung, you got to pay $1,000. If you buy an LG, it's... Well, you only got to pay seven hundred dollars, and it's still got a Snapdragon. Yeah, but that's a slippery slope, right? That's how you that's how you lose the mind share because Absolutely. you're no longer making the halo. And I got it right. because it, the V60 was really well priced for what it was. You mm -hmm. got a lot of bang for your buck on that phone, but you also got a lot of misses on that phone. And I call yeah. it a pseudo flagship in my review. That's what my headline says. I would have. I actually preferred the Velvet over that. Oh, me too. Yeah. Because the Velvet didn't pretend. It was a mid-ranger through and through, yeah. you know, but a premium mid-ranger at that. And I felt like a lot of people were mad at me when I called it a pseudo flagship. But I mean, that's <laughs> the thing you have to understand. It's like, I feel the same way today about the OnePlus 9 that lacks a telephoto and lacks OIS. Like, un-freaking acceptable for a flagship, guys. It's it's so it's so interesting because you, you, you're... We're seeing a lot of this where companies are focusing less and less on these telephoto lenses, but then you have other companies like Samsung and Huawei that are just doubling down on, say, you know, the P40 Pro where that has the 3x yeah. and the 10x lens, and the um, what's the S21 Ultra? Yeah, that's got is it yeah. the same thing, 3x and 10x? Correct, and it's the yeah. P40 Pro Plus and the uh, S21 Ultra right now, but there's more coming. I can say more. Stay tuned. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, though, is that you're right. It's only a very small subset of people doing this right now, companies. There's also the Mi 11 Ultra. I just got one. And it only has one telephoto, but it's a pretty beefy periscope lens. Okay. And so there are a few. But here's the thing, right? Xiaomi on the Mi 11 non-Ultra, the regular, the, the original flagship they launched in January, February, that thing does... Decent telephoto up to 5x because it has a 108 megapixel sensor, right? So you can mm -hmm. get a lot of pixels to zoom into. Other companies are doing, you know, like the OnePlus 9 Pro, right? It has a 3.3x telephoto uh, that holds you over, that gives you telephoto capability, you know, and that to me keeps you covered as flagship. Although I think Periscope is now a flagship defining feature. If your flagship doesn't have a Periscope lens, you know, 5x or something, maybe. In addition to another telephoto, you know, <laughs> or a 10x periscope, you're no longer flash it. And, that, and that's what right. drives me nuts when I see the Oppo Find X3 Pro, such a great phone. But that 2x telephoto, it's actually very good, but it's not it very good in terms of distance magnification, right? And it's disappointing when last year they had a 5x. Right, especially when last year they had a 5x. <sighs> that, that's the shame. Like, why, why do you backtrack from that? So it, it's, it's definitely a clear step in a certain direction to make that change. It's also in all their materials, it doesn't even really say 2x. It all just says 5x hybrid zoom. And yeah. it's like, why are, like, if you're ashamed to say this, then you shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> 100 percent yep yeah. yeah i mean look i think we could go on about this but this is something that's come up in the podcast a lot the whole discussion around the lack of telephoto in the mid-range in particular yeah oppo used to put telephotos on their reno series and yeah. they no longer do now and the reno used to be made of metal and glass and now it's all plastic and they're still charging like these super premium prices for mid-range phones and i think it's because perception now 
on in India where they're probably number one in the mid-range is that they are a premium brands. So they can get away with making plastic phones with no telephotos with the Reno brand. And don't get me wrong, these are great phones otherwise. But I just don't like how BBK is cheapening out on these, what I call, you know, sticker lenses. Like they look like right. they, they could be fake lenses. It doesn't matter, right? Yeah. You wouldn't know if they weren't there. Yeah. They put these sticker lenses on and they put no telephotos and then they're cheapening out on making the chassis, you know, very nice plastic and, Mm. you know, fake looking glass. It still feels cheap to me to do that. When there was a time when Moto sold a Moto G, I think it was a Moto G6, that was aluminum and glass, folks, at $220. So it's possible. There was a time where Xiaomi was making, I think it was the A1 or the A2 series, of $200, $300 phones that were aluminum and glass. So I think, yes, you save money as a company by making a plastic phone at that price point. I get it. But why? Like, you're you're just cannibalizing something that is, I think, very critical. And it's the look and feel and experience of holding and touching that phone. And are you going to say, well, Miriam, it doesn't matter. They're going to put their phone in a case right away. Well, maybe they will. But that's not the point. I, I don't know how to explain it to you. It's like... Would you prefer your car to be made out of plastic or metal and glass? <laughs> like, you know, like, I mean, right. there are some plastic cars out there. I mean, plastic, um, fiberglass that are really nice. Like, I guess the Corvette, for example. There are some plastic phones that are really nice, too. There are some plastic phones, like the unibody plastic Nokias from back in oh, the yeah. day, the Lumias. You can't mention beautiful plastic phones without bringing up those Lumias. I know, I know. But it's possible. The point is, though, that what we're talking about here is To me, plastic is acceptable if you make no excuses of using plastic. Like, here's a good example. Poco M3, $160 phone. That's plastic, but it's unibody. Like, it is one block of plastic that's been Mm -hmm. really well manufactured and the glass screen is attached to it. And it looks, it makes no apologies. It's a plastic phone, but it's really well made, just like the Nokia Lumias were. It's not trying to be glass or aluminum. Whereas you look at the OnePlus 9 with its stupid plastic frame and it (laughs) looks like metal, but we know it isn't. And I feel cheated. Like, you know, a lot of the Nokia phones today and Xiaomi's actually have the mid frame made of plastic where it's clearly is plastic. You know, it's matte and you can feel the texture. Like it doesn't feel cheap, but it feels... Like it doesn't paint it with a fake metal finish to make it look like metal. I think that's when the line, when you cross that line, you start like basically lying to me, you know? And it's the same when you put a glass looking panel in the back that's actually plastic. It's like, screw you. Just (laughs) just don't lie about it. Like we get it. Like you're trying to make this look, but it's not right. Okay. So anyway, I could go on, but back to LG for a second. <laughs> I was going to say, how did we get here from LG? <laughs> ah, Because it's a podcast and that's what we do. <laughs> Absolutely. I want to talk quickly about a couple of more things that came out that I feel were hits and misses. And I think yeah. you touched on some of them. The G8 with the vein detection, you know, like uh, gesture oh, controls. You remember how much of yeah. a gimmicky miss that was? Again, it was this awful. Is, like I felt that the G7 and the V30... V35, V40, those phones and the G6, those phones really competed and tried to compete with Samsung and Apple. You know, they weren't mm-hmm. too innovative, but they did bring some innovation at 18 by 9, etc. But I think that they were trying to, to do that stable branch again. And then they went crazy with the G8, which cut so many features that were critical for this time of flight sensor, vein detection, 3D gesture thing, which was a complete gimmick. Yet at the same time, the the core of the phone was really solid. Everything about it was good, but it was just missing what we expect on a flagship, like the telephoto. Right. And now you're paying for this feature that doesn't even work. It it wasn't good. And the worst part is the G8, there was a version in Korea that had the telephoto. I remember that. Yeah. (sighs) Yep. other stuff like why and you know i think i know why because that's the other thing that i think lg had a problem with at least in the u.s they were always in bed with the freaking carriers oh yeah that was a huge problem and the carriers dictate a lot on the pricing and i think honestly that's what we're seeing with the one plus nine and nine pro dave 2d nailed it in his video essentially mm. the one plus nine only exists to upsell you to the one plus nine pro mm. That makes a lot of sense. But this is how the slippery slope begins where you start losing it. When you were at the V60 briefing, right? Yeah. Do you remember how excited they were to not have a black model? 
Yeah. They were very proud of this because, because they're so um, <laughs> in bed with the carriers, as you put it. Um, that And all, that's what the carriers want. They want a black phone that they could just sell to everybody yeah. that walks in the door. And they were so excited that they some that they somehow managed to just make a blue one and a white one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, I, I think that for me, what bugs me is that, you know, when I see companies like OnePlus making these decisions that are cost cutting and mm-hmm. clearly like they seem very carrier and money driven decisions. I get really worried because this is the beginning of the slope. This is how you slip, right? Like the OnePlus Nord, which is a mid-range phone last year, had OIS. It had a plastic frame, but that's acceptable at $500. The OnePlus 8T just a few months ago had a metal frame and OIS. And here you're coming out with the 9 and you're taking out OIS on the same sensor that had OIS on the 8 Pro the year before. And you're doing a plastic frame like screw you. Like, and it's more expensive by 30 bucks over last year's OnePlus 8. Like, really screw yeah. you. <laughs> it's, really hard to, it's really hard to justify that the, the whole OnePlus 9 series, you know, whether it's the 9 or the 9 Pro, when you, when you start comparing it to what else is sold on the market for those prices. Especially because the Galaxy's always drop by $200 within a month of release or yeah. maybe two or three months of release. And right now, for a while there, you could pick up an S21 Ultra for $1,000 when yeah. the OnePlus 9 Pro is 969 Honestly, even though I prefer Oxygen OS by a mile over One UI, I will 100% buy the S21 at that point. Like, it's just a, overall such a better phone. But I also don't want to dismiss the fact that I think in the absolute, the 9 Pro is a really good phone. It's just overpriced. And it's, again, this opification of OnePlus. I keep calling that in the podcast. I think, you know, Realme is now the price competitive brand for BBK. And and OnePlus used to be, but it no longer is, yet they're turning into Oppo for the markets that don't have the Oppo brand. You know what I'm saying? Right. Why don't they bring the Oppo brand here so I could tell everybody to buy the Find X3 Pro? Which is a great phone. <laughs> you know, just get, give me that phone with US cellular bands. That's all I want. Yeah. I kept saying the last two, three podcasts, if the Oppo Find X3 Pro had 5G bands for the US, I would mm-hmm. make this my main phone today. It doesn't even really have proper 4G bands, does it? It's also a little limited. Like, in 4G. Yeah, it's limited, right? I mean, it depends yeah. on your market. Here in the Bay Area, our 4G footprint on all the carriers is the legacy footprint. So okay. a lot of phones work well. But as soon as you go in newer markets, which require 600 megahertz on T-Mobile and stuff like that, you're, okay. you're kind of SOL. I know? just I remember looking down a lot and seeing the old H+. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of H+, on the Find X3 Pro on T-Mobile as well. So I think you're right. But every now and then I see 5G, which I know is a lie, but it's, you know, because it thinks <laughs> right. it thinks it's on a 5G network. I saw that on, on, on the P40. I'm like, no, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. But look, I think it's it's interesting. But back to the wing, just to kind of finish yes. on LG real quick. I think... There are a couple other things that we need to add about LG before we finish. Well, let's, let's do that. So okay. the thing about the wing to me is that this is an example of innovation that is gimmicky, but really cool. And, yeah. you you know, in my review on Hot Hardware, I said, look, do not buy this phone. But if you're going to buy this phone, if you're the person who changes phones every six months or year, or on one of those plans with your carrier that, you know, lets you change and upgrade mm-hmm. your phones every three months, every six months, every year, absolutely get the wing. Get yeah. the wing for three months, six months, have a good time, show it off, play, experiment with this dual screen stuff. Worst comes to worst, you never use a dual screen and it's a perfectly good phone, right? Right, right. The software is a little iffy, yeah, but you'll live with it for six months. And who cares about upgrades at that point? But yeah. if you are the average consumer who spends <laughs> money for two years, do not buy the wing. Do not no, buy the wing. No, there's no. But speaking of dual screen, we haven't talked about that dual screen accessory that they've used on at least oh. four phones that I could think of. V50, G8X, V60, and Velvet. There you go. Right. Yeah. 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 So that, I mean, that, that was, it was bulky. <laughs> it was hard. It was hard. It was hard to use it. Like you never wanted to carry it in your pocket with no. the phone inside. It's like, cause it was an actual accessory that plugged onto the phone and added a second screen to it. The second screen had a notch without a camera, but it was cool. Right. It was super cool. 
you know, a, a, a second screen accessory when um, this was even before Microsoft made a dual screen phone. Exactly. So, I mean, that's definitely something worth mentioning. I think for me, the challenge with that is that it's too bulky and too impractical. I didn't really like the experience of the dual screen, the way they, again, software didn't match. In the same no. way as on the Microsoft Duo, software just doesn't match the reality. It's not ready yet. Right. And I ended up not carrying the accessory most of the time, you know? And they, yeah, for, for sure. Um, it's, it's also like, it, it was just, it was too big and bulky to just carry around. Yeah. But it was cool that they did it. <laughs> What's the second thing you wanted to mention? Nexus. Oh, yeah. The yeah. Nexus 4 and the Nexus 5 and the Nexus 5X were all LG-based phones. The only OEM to have three Nexus devices. Good point. Yeah. And I would say out of all three of those, the Nexus 5 is my favorite. Is it? Yeah, yeah. probably mine too. Although I love the 5X. It was a sweet spot. $349 for a phone that was essentially a G2 from LG with a smaller screen. That's... That's good. That's yeah. wow. And that that's a phone that's going to be that's going to be one of the classics. And and speaking of plastic without making any excuses for it, like that's what yeah. I'm talking about. It didn't try to be metal and glass. It was just plastic and it was fine. Oh. Uh, and it had the ceramic buttons, which I thought was a nice little touch, you know, like just to make it a little more premium. Uh, the Nexus 5 was yeah. probably my favorite Nexus. Of all of them. Absolutely. Well, when you look back at that whole Nexus lineup before they moved to Pixel, you had uh, Samsung was doing Nexus 10 and it was, uh, and then HTC did a Nexus 9, I think. These yep. big tablets don't, there was nothing super special about them. The Nexus 7 was cool. Uh, but as far as phones go, you had those three from LG, you had the Nexus 6 from Motorola, the 6P from Huawei. The 6P was cool. But the 6P was one of my favorites as well. Absolutely. But I, I think when you look back at all those Nexus devices, the Nexus 5 is the one that, that really stands out. Because like you said, $349 and just everybody that had one loved one. And wireless charging. Yes. And OIS on the camera. Okay. Yes. And I believe the 5X did not have wireless charging. Like hello OnePlus. Mm. It, <laughs> yes. By the way, I'm so glad they finally added wireless charging on the 9. Oh, that's a good thing. Yes. You know, even if it's just 15 watts, like that was such a pain point. But it's, it's again, it's one of the things we expected last year. And so now yeah. it's required now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Ah, uh, freaking OnePlus. I, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm still on my 8 Pro. I'm hesitating to make the 9 Pro my main, even though I like it. But I feel like, mm. okay, can we just take a second for me to rant and say that I am not satisfied with the current state of phones and I cannot decide which flagship to make my next phone. It's certainly not going to be a Pixel at this rate, although we need to talk about that in one second. Maybe that's our we segue. Do. But look, the reality is I can pick. Uh, Find X3 Pro, not, not enough 4G and 5G coverage. Yeah. I love the phone otherwise. Mi 11, great phone. Same thing though, not enough 4G and 5G coverage. And also it lacks a telephoto and that vexes me, even though it does a pretty good job with that 108 megapixel sensor at zooming up to 5X. I haven't played enough with the Mi 11 Ultra yet to tell you what I think, folks, but I just got one, so stay tuned for that. Let's see, what else is there? OnePlus 9 Pro was obviously logically my next candidate having a OnePlus 8 Pro right now. But uh, but what does the OnePlus 8 Pro have that the, that the 9 Pro doesn't? I think the 9 Pro is definitely an improvement over the 8 Pro in yeah. every way, right? Like, there's no doubt. But it's a minor improvement. You know, yeah, I mean, you get an 888, sure. of course. You, you know, you get a slightly better telephoto, and you get the crazy fast 50 watt wireless charging. And that's basically it. Like, the Hasselblad color signs. So, yeah, okay, whatever. But, like, I think... I think for me, it's like, I can't make up my mind. Like I have an S21 Ultra sitting in a box, brand new, not touched yet. And I'm like, should I make that? Like, can I go down this path of being one of those sheep that either buys an <laughs> iPhone or a Samsung? This is vexing me. But at the same time, it is such a great phone. Can I live with one UI? You know, that can I live with the stupid ads and everything? I, I don't know. I yeah. want to support the underdog, Rich, but there's no underdog to support. It really isn't. Well, you know, thank God OnePlus is there because LG is gone now. Yes. HTC is gone now. Uh, Motorola is there, but also not really. Not in the high end, really. You know, they, they have high end if you're on Verizon. Yeah, so, but it's a year old now. The Edge Plus. The Edge Plus. Yeah, it is about a year old now. So I'm, I'm sure they have something else planned. I'm sure it's coming. But look, 
Uh, let's talk about the Pixel 6 rumors because yes. okay, the reason I don't have a Pixel 5 as my main phone is because the screen is too small. That's really it. That's if the it? screen really? was, yeah, if this, and the price, I think the price is vexing me. I think it's overpriced for what it is. For a Snapdragon 765 phone, it should be $100 less. And I know why you pay $100 more because it comes with millimeter wave, whether you like it or not. Right. And that's what you're paying for. Right. I also won't use it because I don't, the, like, the camera is not what it used to be on the Pixel series. Yeah. It's good, but it's showing its age. I mean, it's good, but it doesn't right. improve much over the previous right. gens. The yeah. colors look great, but it's just, it's it's lacking in certain areas now. And um, so, yeah, Whitechapel is a custom processor that they may be using in the Pixel 6. Yeah, and so are we talk, So the big question is everybody's asking, are we going to have another Apple Silicon moment where they're going to blow our minds, right? That's or, the question. I think the answer is no, by the way. No, of course not. I think we shouldn't hype this at all. Is it Apple Silicon or is it Microsoft Silicon, right? Because you're aware of the Surface Pro X where they have the, the yeah. Microsoft SQ1 yeah. in it, which is yeah. literally just a rebranded Snapdragon 8 CX. Oh, you think that's what it's going to be? You think it's going to be a rebranded Qualcomm chip? No, no. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't go that far, but it's like, like are, they, are they going the Apple route of, of building something, like licensing the ARM instruction set and building a chip based on it from the ground up? No. Google doesn't have the team for that. I don't even think. Yeah, no. You know, um, I, I'm sure. Like, what what I want to believe that this is is like um, Moto X. You know, um, where they they had custom chips, custom chips, right? So, so remember the Moto X? Like, it had mid range hardware, but it had like co processors yep. or something, yep. like whatever. Yep. And um, well, in a way, they've done that with the Pixel, whatever it's called, the the Pixel chip. You know, there was that image processing chip up to the Pixel right. Four, I guess. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So they they could do something like that and just kind of put put a package together, and and it looks like Samsung is going to be the one that's going to be fabbing this stuff, right? For sure. Who else? I mean, GSMC. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I guess <laughs> Intel could. They want to. They want to build ARM chips. Oh now. right, that's so. right. Intel's finally seen the reason. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I don't want. This is too early to predict. To me, what I really want this is. I know I, I'm I sound like a broken record. <laughs> the Pixel Four to me felt a lot like that LG G5. The beginning of a slippery slope where you yeah. are abandoning your stable main release and going into crazy beta land too much. And because of that... But did it feel like the G8 with the... <laughs> no, it was just as flawed though. The, the point I'm making is that I want a Pixel 6 that has a Snapdragon 888 or a flagship grade chip, because obviously it's not going to be a Snapdragon 888, and right. I want it to have a bigger screen. If you can deliver that, Google, and not compromise anything else by making it worse, please give me a fingerprint sensor. Most Android apps still require one until you can come up with an API that works like Apple's API across all your biometric sensors that works with all the existing apps. I do not want a custom 3D time of flight ID sensor that doesn't work with my apps. I, I, I also want some significant camera improvements. Right. Yes. The guy, the guy that uh, I I don't know the guy's name off the top of my head. The the pixel camera guy. He's gone. He's gone. Do you happen to know his name? No, I can't remember right now. Damn it, because that guy deserves. Don't worry. We know. We know. Let's continue. <laughs> but but that that guy's gone. Um, and we need some camera improvements, right? So so yeah. I would love to see some kind of custom ISP in this chip. You know, that can do some really cool things. I don't know. I, I, the thing is, the thing is, like when you talk about Google making a chip that's custom for Android, that's 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 not a thing, because the Snapdragon eight eighty eight is already designed for Android. It's not like it's some general purpose chip that they shove in a smartphone chassis. No, this is yeah. an Android processor. So, and and they're already working with Google on on making it optimized for Android in the best way that it can be. So this is this should be something. That's designed for the hardware. That's it should, it should be designed for Pixel, not necessarily designed for Android. So I hope that it can it can provide some camera improvements that we can't really see elsewhere, and um, I, I would imagine some uh, you know Google Assistant improvements type of thing, Barfield voice mics. Yeah, Which I don't and, care about, but I, I would bet that'll, that'll have something. But that's to do. the thing. I hate to say this, but I don't care about this stuff. Right. I don't either. Yeah. I want Google to deliver the core functionality properly, which yeah. I don't feel they're doing anymore. Like the Pixel 5 is a great phone, but the screen is too small. Core functionality is a big screen. 
for most mm-hmm. people and a big battery to go with it. And core functionality, as you said, is better cameras. Now, currently, my favorite Pixel, the one I would in a heartbeat adopt as my main phone today, even though it's a mid-range phone, is the 4A 5G. The reason I'm not adopting it is because it lacks an absolutely critical feature for me, which is wireless charging. Right. At that price point, it's perfect. The 4A 5G is the perfect $500 5G phone hit me because i if you're not if you're not in agreement you can you can slap me on this one because i i am 100 percent correct i'm pretty sure that anyone who picks up a pixel 4a at 350 dollars or a 4a 5g at 500 dollars will be 100 percent satisfied with their product for the money they spent absolutely except for the fact that they have to go into it understanding that it's not water resistant and it doesn't have wireless charging and for me, the water resistance is not the biggest deal. But the wireless charging, I just cannot live without. Like, I just cannot. Like, yeah, it's not here. something I use, like, all the time. But I'd, I'd say I'd use it at least once a day. I have a charging, a Pixel charging stand on my desk, and I use it. Right. So I want to see that. And, and I'm kind of sick. If I'm going to spend the kind of money that I'm expecting to spend on a Pixel flagship, I want a flagship grade chip. The 765G is a lovely chip, and I have no issues with it, but it's not what I want, which is why I'm right. on a OnePlus 8 Pro for the first time, because OnePlus addressed two things I wanted. It put wireless charging in its phones last year, fine, on the one phone, and it delivers great very similar to Pixel software experience and everything else I wanted a flagship, telephoto, ultra wide, la, 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 la. And, you know, 9 Pro does the same. But the 9 Pro is no longer as competitively priced to me when you see Samsung delivering, you know, deals that are incredible on the S21. And that's the challenge. I feel like, I feel like Samsung finally observed OnePlus from its like imagine Samsung as a bear, right? Like a big creature. And it finally noticed OnePlus, little agile OnePlus come in its field of vision. Mm-hmm. And it didn't squash it, but it just went like, oh, we can do the same thing. You know, Galaxy S20 Fan Edition. It completely right. walks all over any OnePlus 8 from last year. It really does. At a yeah. price that is even more competitive. And this is what we're seeing with the OnePlus 9 Pro and it's so hard to justify when Samsung has discounts. And you're going to say, well, you shouldn't judge it on, you should judge it on the original price. Well, that doesn't matter when you can walk into a carrier store and get a BOGO deal that is out the kazoo on the freaking S21 series and you can't get that on the 9. Yeah. <sighs> what are we going to do, Rich? What are we going to do? I don't know. We should start our own phone company and we'll make our own phones. <laughs> but there you go. Oh yeah. That's gonna be that's gonna be smart. Okay, so let's quickly talk about the A series. Uh, the Samsung Galaxy A series was recently launched worldwide and uh, you know it's finally come to the US. And the one that stands out to me, there's a bunch. This is A02, A12, A32, A42, A52, yeah. right? That's it. Yeah. We're not getting the A72. Yeah. Okay, so the one that stands out to me in all that is what if I told you, audience, that there is a 5G smartphone that costs $280 and doesn't suck spec wise on paper? That's what the Samsung Galaxy A32 5G delivers. It has a MediaTek Dimensi 720 in there. So kudos to MediaTek for making the cheapest 5G phone in the US possible. And it has a 48 megapixel main sensor and 8 megapixel ultra wide. 90 hertz display. A 90 hertz display, sticker cams. But look, the reality is the only thing I can see that's negative about this phone is that it's a 720p LCD display. You know, like... If it was 1080p, I would just walk away and drop the mic and say, you're done. This is it. Right. Right. But I mean, I mean, do you, are you expecting uh, 1080p at this this price point, though? Yes. For the, the... Yes. Yeah? Because $20 more buys you a OnePlus Nord N10 5G with 120 hertz 1080p display. Yes, that's true. Okay. Now, it has a Snapdragon 690, but I bet you the Snapdragon 690 is very much on parity with the Dimensity 720. So with that elephant in the room, as much as I do not like the build quality and materials and industrial design of the OnePlus Nord N10 5G, and I'd pick the A32, frankly, mm-hmm. 720p is a little, feels a little cheap to me. It does. But that's it. I think it's good news. I think we're going to see, we might see by the end of the year, a phone in the US hitting $200 with 5G, potentially with the Qualcomm Snapdragon 480. 480, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the time is right for something like that. And it's it's also, I mean, we, we've been looking at 5G phones for a couple of years now. 
and and it's it's time for them to just be in everything that that's on the market. Hundred you know? percent. And I'm tired of talking about it. Yeah, you know, I'm tired of five G being a thing. Like it's just let's just let it be everywhere. Now. I mean, look, the reality is that I know my audience knows this. Like I, that's why I never have to mention it. Really, is that I don't think five G matters right now that much for most people. But if you buy a phone, do yourself a favor, buy one that Get supports 5G. it. Yeah. Because look, this is the reality. It's gonna when it comes, it's gonna come quick. In the last year alone, five G has really improved significantly. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's it's real. It's happening. Do you need it? Not necessarily, but do you want to have it? Potentially, yes. I mean, if you want to keep your phone for two years, you probably want to have it. Especially if you want to keep your phone for two years. Although my audience is more likely to change phones more often. But right. a quick aside, because I want to briefly have you give us the lowdown and the rundown on the Lenovo Legion phone. But I want to let folks know, keep an eye out on April 14th for the new Xperia phone that's coming. I know the details and I can't say more than that. And I'm telling you, stay tuned. This is... This is going to be a hot one. So April 14th, Xperia phone launch. You know, keep in mind, this is going to be a niche product, of course. But this podcast is all about niche. (laughs) We love the underdog. (laughs) And Rich, tell us about the Lenovo Legion, whatever it's called now. The Lenovo Legion Phone Dual 2. So this is their second generation gaming phone. And so therefore, it is just, it's a beast. It's got dual fans in it to keep that Snapdragon 888 uh cool it comes with like up it comes with up to 18 gigs lp ddr5 memory 18 wow. gigs that's more than any laptop that i have <laughs> isn't the rog phone isn't one of the models of the rg phone 5 have 18 gig as well that's possible i, I don't know i think so yeah. but um yeah so i mean the, the the one of the big things is the is the cooling obviously it's also got a 44 megapixel front-facing camera that pops up out of the side because the, it's meant to be used horizontally 44 when i saw that i was like what sensor is a 44 megapixel? i've never heard of that anyway it's according to the spec sheet samsung gh1 plus i have never heard of this yeah maybe it's a new sensor maybe uh but but and and that can record 4K video up to 60 frames per second. So it's meant for streaming. That's why it pops out of the side because it's meant to be used horizontally. Right. Um, 144 hertz display, which is gives you that little extra millisecond edge when you're playing games. Um, I, I reviewed, did you, did you get to review the original one last year? No, but I saw it. I mean, I saw the coverage. Yeah. Interesting for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a beast of a phone. It's it's not something that I could ever just carry and say like, hey, this is the fastest, most powerful thing around because it's just too heavy. It's bulky. But if you're into gaming, it is cool. It's got it's got virtual triggers on the sides of on the on the corners of the phone. So it's like it's like you're using a controller. It's really cool. Yeah, no, I, it looks great. Unfortunately, Zach at Jerry Rig broke it. Did really? you see that video? Yeah, he snapped it in half. Wow. You know how it has that cooling fan module uh, between the two batteries? Mm-hmm. Like, so you know how it's the, the back of it is three panels, right? There is a panel left and a panel on the right, which are glass. And the yeah. middle has this little pod that has the fan in it and the Legion logo. It broke right at the seam of one of those two panels. So like it, it, it snapped in wow. half with the pod kind of like breaking off. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm not saying this to be mean to Lenovo. Like these extreme bending tests that some YouTube creators are doing, especially Zach, he's going to put things through its paces. That's given. But it's interesting to see that having, you know, a seam there that's clearly a seam in the design is obviously a point of a weakness. And and nobody's going to do this kind of thing. Like nobody's going to literally take their phone in between two hands and as hard as possible, try to bend it. The worst you might do is sit on it in your back pocket. It's important, though, because I, I don't know how how hard some people game. But if you're holding that thing and you're getting intense, you might start to. Hold it a little too tight. So like it's it's important to take a look at how easily this thing's gonna break. Really though. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, listen, I wish I could elaborate a little more on this, but we need to wrap up. So do you want to tell folks where they can find you on the internet, Rich? Well, for now, um <laughs> you can find me at NeoWin and at the Rich Woods on Twitter. I'm gonna be at NeoWin though only until the end of next week, and then um, you know. At the Rich Woods on Twitter to find out where I'll end up next. Yeah, some you've got some exciting news ahead, I believe. I am pumped. You should definitely follow Rich on Twitter to find out what happens for him next. 
And folks, you know where to find me on the internet. I'm at Tank Girl. That's T-N-K-G-R-L. That's uh, the comic book character, Tank Girl. Drop the vowels. And you basically have my Twitter handle and my Instagram handle. Follow me on Twitter and follow me on Instagram. Twitter is where you can kind of comment about the show. And Instagram is where I have photos of phones and photos taken with phones. So also remember, there's a couple of YouTube channels to subscribe to. YouTube.com slash Mobile Tech Podcast is the main channel where I have unboxing videos, mostly some reviews, some hands-ons, that kind of stuff. Check it out. And then we have a YouTube.com slash Mobile Tech More. My producer and I are kind of trying to sort out what we want, content we want there, but you should subscribe because that way it helps us monetize. It is basically going to be all the cool smart home, travel, you know, van life tech that is related to mobile that we can get our hands on and we have time to create content for. So check that out. It's going to be fun. Also, the podcast lives at mobiletechpodcast.com. So please subscribe, tell your friends. In addition to the website, there is, of course, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, all the places where good podcasts can be found is where you can subscribe to the show. And uh, there's a donate link in the show notes. Please consider donating if you can. That'd be great. That helps us along. And I want to thank MediaTek for being our sponsor this week. MediaTek powers the TV brands you love and delivers incredible performance, advanced intelligence, and brilliant picture quality. Whether 8K, 4K, or streaming, MediaTek's advanced chips and TV technologies deliver incredible experiences and make your smart TV the center of your intelligent home. So thanks again to MediaTek for sponsoring us this week, and thanks again to you, Rich, for being a guest on the show. Thanks for having me. I'm always happy to be here. Of course. We'll definitely have you on again. And folks, we'll have another show next week, so stay tuned for that. Until then, cheers, everybody. This has been the Mobile Tech Podcast with Tank Girl, proudly presented by worldpodcasts.com. You can visit us online at mobiletechpodcast.com.